Are you a professional woman who wants to create passive income streams and financial freedom through real estate investing? Join us here on Real Estate Investor Goddesses, hosted by Monique Alm. Listen to women who are rocking it in real estate investments as they share their stories of success, failures, and best advice in real estate investing. Start creating real wealth through real estate. Tune in today. Here's your host, real estate investor, syndicator, and developer, Monique Holm. Welcome to the Real Estate Investor Goddesses podcast. I'm your host, Monique Holm. On this show, I interview badass, amazing real estate investor goddesses, women that are doing amazing things in the real estate investing space. And I am so excited today to have with me Rashawn Lee. Rashawn is someone I met at uh, one of my favorite places, FinCon. This is a conference yes. for financial influencers, people, influencers in the financial space, people who have podcasts or YouTube channels or uh, blogs, etc. And she has a really popular YouTube channel and learn, hustle, and grow, and which she's started with her husband. And she's in search of a more balanced life to prioritize financial independence. So she and her husband, Rob, are real estate investors who are also invested in the stock market, had no consumer debt, paid off their mortgage after getting serious about their money. They are now debt-free empty nesters living their best life and working towards financial freedom with the goal of having more control over their time. They also recently traveled all around the world. It was quite an adventure and I'm super excited to have her here and share like how she did it, how they did it and what they're doing now. So welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Monique. You just said a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you have, there's a lot to say about you. You've you wow. done so much and it's been incredible. I remember we were recently in Austin and I was just looking at all of these incredible pictures from your travels all oh, over the world. It's definitely been quite a ride. Yeah. So how did you, how'd you get started in real estate investing? How did you got, you were both in the military, right? Yep. So Rob and I are both veterans. However, we did not meet in the military. We get that question all the time. I served as a member of the U.S. Army Reserves and Rob served as a member of the U.S. Marine Corps. Now, I got started in real estate investing just through buying my first home. I bought my first home in 2002. Rob and I met in late 2007 and were married in 2009. And Rob always had a dream of being a real estate mogul. Now, at the time that we got married, I was down with keeping the one we had and buying another home, but I wasn't yet sold on the idea of investing in real estate broadly. However, he did change my mind. He convinced me and we turned my first home into our first rental property back in 2013. So what convinced you? What did he, what were you resistant to? And then what, what actually convinced you to, to go more broad? So for me personally, Monique, I had a very high stress job. Now high pain, but high stress as well, right? You, you don't get something for nothing. And they are paying you a lot of money so that they can take up your time in accordance with what they need you to accomplish, right? And just as a, as a sales professional in corporate America, I just didn't have the time to think about investing in real estate. And I think that happens to a lot of people. You get so bogged down in the day-to-day -day grind. Um, don't forget, we also have two children. We are a blended family with two boys who are adults now. But at the time, you know, I was a full-time working mom. When I met Rob, I was a single mom. So there was always something that needed to be done. And yeah. it was just, and just the idea of thinking about investing outside of my retirement account, it just seemed like a lot. Yeah. So that was my only resistance to it, honestly. I think a lot of women have that resistance. Like, I'm already so busy. <laughs> I <don't, laughs> I got the kids, I got the, you know, the job. How can I yeah. do it? What got you over that resistance? So Rob had always been or had been listening to a podcast called Bigger Pockets mm -hmm. for years. I know you're familiar with it. Yeah. And he was a huge fan. I just happened to be at a point where I was 
uh, open to listening to, you know, podcasts and, and he's like, please just listen to the podcast. I started listening to the podcast and thought, okay, there are definitely some things here that, you know, that makes sense. And we could do some of this just based on, just based on where we are right now financially. So when we came together, um, we decided to join our finances and that was huge for us. Joining our finances gave us a better look at the big picture. Yeah. And so once I got on board with the idea of investing in real estate and believing that this was an opportunity for our future long term, uh, we started looking for rental properties back in 2013. And the market had started to change, right? Rob had had this idea during the recession and he was already interested when we got married. But as a newly married couple, I just thought, the idea of going out and buying a lot of real estate together is probably not what you want to do in your first couple of years of marriage. I just thought it could be really stressful. I also felt the same way about buying a new home, right? So we were married in 2009 and didn't buy our next home until 2013. So we took it slow, but I feel like that helped us to really build an incredible foundation. And um, after that, we just kept, kept pushing. So what did you do after that? So the first thing, which is a, a common way a lot of people uh, start is they have a house they're already using, they get another yeah. house, they rent out the previous house. Yeah, which um, honestly is the easiest way to go, right? I mean, it's a very, it's a very easy way to start. Right. I mean, and we common. already owned the property for years by that point, right? If yeah. I bought it in 2002, 2013. So the house at this point is almost paid off. Um, then we buy our new larger home, which is the house we live in now, where you see those chairs in the background. This, <laughs> <laughs> this is where we record our YouTube videos also. <laughs> and uh, when we bought this house and rented that one out, we made a commitment to buy one new rental property a year based on what our, um, based on what our budget was for rentals here in the Dallas Fort Worth area. And so we kept up with that. We bought one new property a year. And then eventually we invested in a syndication as the market started to change, right? The prices started to increase. We thought syndication is a, a good way to get in. So at this point, we're a part of a deal where there are, you know, more than a hundred units. And then we decided, I want to say in 2018, before we before we left before we left the company to travel before we left the country to travel we left our job we and before we left our jobs right this is key we always tell people who want to invest in real estate don't quit your job yet <laughs> the easiest way to get financing for a rental property is to have a w2 job so we sure. knew we wanted to leave so we started taking advantage of all the different vehicles we'd learned about them through the podcast we'd listened to and, and the books we'd read so we sold one property in 1031 exchange from a single family year and purchased a six unit out of state so that was our first out of state and first small multifamily that was an incredible opportunity then we did a cash out refinance on that first property. That and 2002 one. This is, yep, exactly. Cash mm -hmm. out refinance on that property and paid off our primary residence. And then we sold a property that we weren't really in love with and used the profits from that sale to fund our, tra our, our, our year of travel around the world. Incredible. So we're pulling, it. we're pulling every lever. <laughs> That's if there's an idea we've tried, we're like, oh, wait, we can do that. <laughs> so talk, talk to us about that trip around the world, because I think a lot of people decide or think, yeah, I want to do that because I'd love to, I'd love to travel. I'd love to be able yeah. to do that. So how did, um, you know, what did you have to line up in order to be able to do that trip and tell us? Tell us a little bit more about what that that whole experience was like for you. It's funny that you asked. So I am actually uh, having lunch with a girlfriend of mine that I've known since high school. She's in town today and she had traveled the world when we were in our 20s. And it sounded so glamorous. I was like, oh my God, I want that life. I, I can't wait. And then it was, you know, even better to do it with my spouse who loves to travel. And the way a 20 something travels the world versus the way a 40 something travels the world are not, not the same. same. 
<laughs> <laughs> but, you know, since, you know, we have been best friends for so long, she was giving me a lot of input and she had a lot of great insight. So the way we decided to get started was we just bought a one-way ticket to our first country. And then we planned we were going to buy one-way tickets from there. Guys, this is really a complex way to do it. Just saying, if you decide to do this, because- you wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> no, no, it's stressful because, you know, you don't know your next, you can have, we had an idea of what our next des destination was. We started in Argentina. So we landed in uh, Buenos Aires on uh, December 31st of 2018 to ring in the new year, right? Mm -hmm. And um, on our way there, someone had already gotten one, hold of one of our credit cards and started charging in New York. Oh, no. <laughs> oh yes. When you start oh. internet traveling internationally, it's like the, the credit card thieves and fr the fraud is, is unreal. So that was, just, that was the first time that happened, but not the last time during the course of our travel. <laughs> Oh, no. But yeah, but you know, the credit cards do protect you from that, right? I mean, unless you yeah. have a history of reporting this kind of thing, they take it seriously and they and they gave us the money back. But so that's how we started in Buenos Aires. In Buenos Aires and from there, um, we visited uh, four different states in Argentina. And uh, from there, we went to Brazil. So we hopped. So our first, con we, when we knew we were going to try to hit all the continents with the exception of Antarctica. So by the end of 2019, we had uh, visited six continents and over 35 countries and Incredible. maybe maybe 50 cities in each country. It, it, it was really it was really quite spread out. So we, we had done a lot during the course of that time. So a lot of the world. Yeah, that's amazing. And you had good timing because you left. Yeah, 20, you came back. Yes, <laughs> yes, we came back right before the pandemic hit, yes. Because I had a, I was going to travel around the world in 2020. So oh. We started 2020 in Australia and we were going to go around and. Oh, yeah. I had different plans for me. So. I understand, I understand. We were really going to push our, um, our travel business into full force in 2020. But, you know, all bookings are canceled or rescheduled and a travel agent doesn't get paid unless you actually make the trip. <laughs> well, man, that's amazing, though. Yeah. And that, I think, is what a lot of people strive for, just to have that freedom yeah. to, to do what you want, whether it's, you know, go to 35 countries in a year or just be able to play golf every day. Yeah, right. Um, it's, it's been a blessing and we are fully aware of that fact. Yeah, we are grateful and thank God every day. So you have done obviously a lot of things right. And though I, I think we learn the most, not when things go right, but when things don't go right. Mm. So what would you say was your biggest mistake and what did you learn from it? Okay, so from an investing perspective, I will say the, the, on, the only real estate investment that we've lost money on was our syndication. The syndication really? deal that we were a part of, yes. And the, so, you know, if you are familiar with syndication, which I know you are, I, but sure. speaking no, from the perspective yeah. of, you know, someone who might, who are, who's listening, it might not be a uh, syndicate. When you have a syndication deal, there's a deal maker. The deal maker is responsible for finding the deal and gathering funding. And he has a C, he has a CPA, he has an attorney. He puts, he or she puts together all the components of the deal and then they simply you know reach out to investors for funding yeah. right so our deal maker was very exper experienced he had done a lot of deals came highly recommended we met him as a referral through one of rob's uh, former colleagues and you know we were really excited about this opportunity because it was actually in waco texas and who doesn't know waco right <laughs> now that you know we've had fixer upper there I mean, they used to be known for the cults, but yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I 
that. But I think a lot of people know it, but not as a real estate investing. <laughs> right, but but Fixer Upper came in. If you if anybody who watches Fix, uh, who watches HGTV knows Chip and Joanna. Okay, so they came in and they flipped a ton of houses in that area and that really developed that city. Um, the city is also known for Baylor University. Baylor mm-hmm. University is a, a large um, private university and is quite expensive. So we thought, hmm, this would be a great opportunity because you could provide alternative student housing yeah. for those students who might not be able to afford um, the higher end dorms or higher end apartments. So, and we'd always wanted to try investing in, in a college town. We thought it would be a great opportunity. Our deal maker actually was, uh, uh, or is alumni from Baylor. Oh, Baylor. He okay. attended and graduated. So we thought this, uh, you know, what what doesn't sound great about this money? Mm-hmm. I mean, so what went wrong? <laughs> well, what we had were class C properties and our, our syndication deal was a bundle of three different properties, but they were class C in nature in a class, you know, B plus area because it was right near the university. However, they were class C as far as what they offered in amenities. And what I believe went wrong is the fact that kids who are willing, kids and their parents who are willing to pay $50,000 a year for tuition, room, and board, don't want Class C housing. Right. So there was a ton of Class A and B plus, um, you know, properties Options. or apartments in, yeah. Yeah, in the area. And we just never could get that thing to the 90% to even do the cash out refi portion of it. So we didn't get the investment back there. And then since we could not keep it at the occupancy level that we needed, it never even reached quarterly payouts. And we Uh bought that back in 2016. That was an investment we made in 2016. We're supposed to be ready to be out of it in after three years, out of it and profitable. Profitable. We held it through 2020, and at the end of 2020, we made the decision to exit, and we lost. Uh, we made a fifty thousand dollar investment. I want to say we lost twenty two thousand. Wow. Maybe more. Maybe more. I'm trying to think. I want to do my math right. I think we got. I think we got around twenty. I think we maybe we lost 50 percent. I think we got twenty five thousand dollars back 25 20, 25 or 28 yeah that is painful yes um, especially since you know we could have easily put that into a couple of single family homes and yeah you know and and you know continued our buy and hold strategy which has continued to be successful so as a as a syndicator and sponsor, I can think of certain things that I would have told you differently, <laughs> or why where I wouldn't have gone with that particular deal. But what do you, what did you learn from that? Uh, right now, our position is that we're going to continue to manage our own real estate because even in the deals that we've bought that we haven't loved, they've all been profitable, and that's yeah. what we're and that's what we're in this for. We're in, we're in it for the money. Yeah. <laughs> so. You know, from a spot because you know, I think the many, many um, that it's so, so there's so many things about that that surprise me. I mean, yeah, I, I mean, guess, he, he's I don't an know author what, as well. I don't like know I what said. the occupancy was like, um, before. So, mm-hmm. normally, you know, I, I invest in things that are already they're cash flowing from day one, mm-hmm. that are, there's already a they're usually they're stabilized already, so it'd be already at 90. 90% plus mm-hmm. occupancy when, when I buy them. That's how I invest. Um, so that's that would be a different thing. This was a I'm, deal that where there was some money put into it to fix it up, right? And I yeah, believe that then, that was the goal. Then, yeah, that once we like, fix it up, then we're going to get, you know, even more. You yeah. know, like I said, it, it sounded like a great opportunity. But right. So I guess understanding, understanding the student market more so if that mm-hmm. was going to be your tenant base mm-hmm. understanding what they were looking for would have helped yes um you know having a yeah having great property management that understood that area yeah and I think you know as the, and the and the the deal maker or, he came back and you know he said guys this is the first deal I've ever lost on and I think I have a lot to learn about the student housing market yeah but also it's like it's hard to believe that something bought in 2016 just with like the market mm-hmm. appreciation mm-hmm. old in 2020 wouldn't make yeah. money That's- yeah commercial real estate wasn't doing that great in 2020 
right? And the, oh, the, the residential was doing excellent, but not, well, let me just say here in this market, in the Waco, Texas Got market, it. the commercial space for this class, he was not doing great. Now, if we had held it till 2021, when everybody decided that they wanted to buy into, you know, more of these larger multifamilies, because yeah. like our, our smaller multifamilies continue to do great. But these larger ones where you needed someone who could come in and buy up 100 units. Yeah, I'm sure yeah. in 2020, if we had helped till 2021, we might have, you know, been able to get out with a profit. Yeah, I think so. There was a point in 2020 where it was really hard to do financing. Yeah. Um, the banking was Yes, Maybe. yes, they so closed down like, a lot of opportunities for investors. Yeah, bad timing. Yeah, yeah, oh, but it wasn't profitable up until then, so that's why I was like, yeah. We're not gonna blame COVID, right? No, it's just to sell it because I was like, Ooh, even yes, the market appreciation, <laughs> yes, right? You know, should have helped at that point, but hmm, okay. Well, <laughs> yeah, that's something you, you've learned a lot, but um, yeah. Yeah, we're always okay. learning. We yeah. take it as a lesson and keep it pushing. Mm -hmm. And what are you most proud of? Oh, wow. I'm most proud of the fact that our YouTube channel just reached 7,500 subscribers. <laughs> YouTube is much harder than I thought it would be. <laughs> so I'm really excited that we're seeing some growth there. That's exciting. And um, to what do you, do you attribute your success? Been, oh, well, investing. I'm going to say uh, teamwork. My husband and I make a great team. We have an excellent partnership. And like I said, it really started by building our foundation early on in our marriage, um, you know, praying and believing the best for each other. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, just making that decision to, to, you know, to really accept two becoming one. Mm -hmm. And things could have gone a lot different had we not made that decision, you know, we also, you know, we did premarital counseling. We did as much as we could to make sure that we were on the same page as a couple. And then that really helped us with everything else that we wanted to do after that, whether it's investing in real estate, investing in the stock market, traveling the world, you know, everything really started with us creating that foundation early on. I love it. And what advice do you have for a woman who's just starting out? For a woman who is just starting out, invest in yourself. If you can't afford to invest in real estate right now, for whatever reason, invest in an education. Take some courses, you know, listen to great podcasts like this one, you know, watch some YouTube videos, do everything you can to fill yourself with the knowledge and information that you need, because it will help to boost your confidence. And when you get out there to make that first deal, you need confidence because it can be scary. Now, after that first one, I think, you know, a lot of us get really comfortable, uh, but just feed yourself with as much knowledge and information as you can, even if it's just getting us getting a side hustle until you until you have your funding ready. But but do something. That's such great advice. And what do you wish you'd known at the beginning that you now know? Oh, I wish I'd bought more properties. <laughs> I wish I'd known that the price in 2013, when I thought it was going up, wasn't up. <laughs> I mean, no. we, bought, we, bought one a year, we bought one a year, but I wish I'd known that we should buy two a year. <laughs> or more. Right. Uh, just speaking from my own courage, level of courage. <laughs> I was like, be real, even if you knew. <laughs> Same with me. It's like that's, that's one of those things. Like I wish I knew. I wish I bought yes. more earlier. Yes, yes, that's right. That's right. I wish I'd known that. Um, but hopefully, somebody who's listening is like, okay, <laughs> well, you know now. Okay, right. It's like when's the best time to plant a tree? Twenty years ago. What's the next best time today? It was the same that's with right. real estate. That's know? right. Yeah, it would have been great to you know the bottom of the market. <laughs> yeah. So there's still opportunity, always. Okay, so before we get into our famed end of show trinity, which is a brag, a gratitude, and desire, what is the best way for people to connect with you, find out more about what you're doing? So our YouTube channel is Learn Hustle Grow. Um, Instagram, Learn Hustle Grow. 
and Twitter, Learn, Hustle, Grow. So, you know, feel free to reach out, check out the videos, you know, post a comment. We do respond to all of them. We're really excited about the engagement. Awesome. So learn, hustle, grow on all the socials. <laughs> That's right. All right. So now it's time for our Trinity. What is, what is one thing you're celebrating right now? What is your brag? Oh, right now we are celebrating and bragging. Oh God. I guess I thought I was, I thought I was answering that when I answered the YouTube, when I the YouTube <laughs> growth. Uh, so we're celebrating and bragging that we have survived as members of the self-employed community for the last three years now. So we left corporate America in 2018 and have not had W2 jobs since though. We have celebrated a full three year anniversary this year. Congratulations and well bragged. Thank and you. What's one thing you are grateful for? Oh gosh, I am grateful for every day. I'm grateful for the opportunity to, to live the life that we live and to be a blessing to others as well, just through being able to help our family directly or being able to share our story and our experience with others who just might need to see an example that reflects who they are when they see us. Mm, beautiful. And you have been a blessing to so many. Uh, thank you. And you. lastly, what is one thing you desire? One thing I desire is for all women to be able to take care of themselves. I love the idea of a partnership and a healthy marriage. I have unfortunately seen some circumstances where the marriage doesn't work out and the woman is left in a position to be unable to support herself. And the women are generally, in most families, the primary caregiver of the child and can become the sole caregiver. So my wish is that all women take a position to learn something, sometimes skill or tool or invest or investment strategy that allows them to take care of themselves under any circumstance. Mm. So shall your desire be or so much better than you can imagine. Amen. Yeah. Thanks. I, I share that. Well, I, my mission is to help 1 million women create financial freedom through real estate investing. So I, I hear and you. That's, and that's why I, was, I agreed to do the podcast because I understand your mission and I fully support it. I love that. Well, I'm so glad you came on. Thank you for, for sharing your, your brilliance. I loved hearing your story. So y'all, you can connect with Rashawn at Learn, Hustle, Grow on YouTube, on Twitter, on Instagram. And connect with me at REI Goddesses on Instagram and reigoddesses.com. You go to our website, then you can find out about our programs, our events, our, um, our investor club, and get our free guide, How to Invest in Real Estate from $1 to $1 million. Investing strategies for every budget, yes. and every goddess. <laughs> All right. And definitely subscribe so you won't miss another Real Estate Investor Goddesses podcast interview. Bye-bye. You have just listened to another episode of Real Estate Investor Goddesses, a show dedicated to sharing stories of women creating real wealth through real estate. If you found value on what you just heard, feel free to share with your friends. Visit us at reigoddesses.com to learn more about our programs and live events, as well as to access other resources. Until next time.